A 70 years old male with progressive difficulty solving food which started approximately six months back with solids and now he is also having difficulty with uh, swallowing water. There is associated history of weight loss and decreased appetite. A 40 years old female patient presented with dysphagia to both liquids and solids and regurgitation for three months. The, but the dysphagia is non progressive. What is the most likely diagnosis? You have some options there, you can choose from those options. From medical unit 4, and our uh, topic of discussion is approach to dysphagia. So dysphagia, as you all know, is difficulty in swallowing, while odynophagia is painful swallowing and global sensation is a sensation of lump or retained food bolus. So these are the stages of deglutition. There, there is an oral stage, which includes the mastication and the salivation, and then the movements of the tongue and the palate that move the actually the bolus from the oral stage to the pharyngeal part of the mouth. Uh, in pharyngeal stage, there is closure of the oral, nasopharyngeal, and, and laryngeal parts, and then there is opening of the cricopharynx. And in esophageal uh, stage, this is the involuntary stage in which there is the pro propulsion of the bolus from throughout the esophagus to the stomach. Okay, in this diagram, you can see that the bolus here, which is A, is in the oral phase, and then here it goes into the pharyngeal phase, and then the involuntary esophageal phase and here it enters the stomach. Dysphagia can be divided into acute and then non-acute dysphagia. Acute dysphagia is the onset of inability to swallow anything. Usually it develops after taking protein meals and the food bolus is actually get stuck within the uh, esophagus and this can be removed by upper GI endoscopy. Dysphagia, we have either oropharyngeal dysphagia or esophageal dysphagia. Oropharyngeal dysphagia is the stage 1 and the stage 2 of the swallowing, and esophageal dysphagia is the stage 3 of the swallowing mechanism we have already shown you. In oropharyngeal, there is difficulty initiating the swallowing. Always remember, there is this difficulty initiating the swallowing. The patient usually points to the cervical region uh, while pointing that this, this, this is the part where something has stuck. May, may accompany this this may accompany nasopharyngeal regurgitation aspiration sensation of residual food in the pharynx while esophageal dysphagia uh, which is uh, usually the, the stage 3 of the swallowing it it the, the, the patient feels difficulty swallowing several seconds after the initiation of the swallowing so it, uh, there is no problem while initiating the swallowing but after the initiating of the swallowing, after a few seconds, few several seconds of initiating of the swallowing, he or she has a difficulty, feeling of difficulty. There is feeling of food stuck in the esophagus, which is retrosternal area or the suprasternal notch. For oropharyngeal dysphagia, there can be atrogenic. Always remember uh, for the post-surgical uh, radiation and corrosive intake leading to oropharyngeal dysphagia. Infections, always remember botulism, Lyme disease, and diphtheria. Uh, in metabolic thyrotoxicosis is very important. In myopathy, the myasthenia gravis, dermatomyositis, connective tissue disorders, and myotonic dystrophy is important. And structural, there is do not forget the congenital cleft palate, diverticular pouches, and cervical webs. Uh, and Zanker's diverticulum. In neurological causes, there can be stroke, cerebral palsy, G and Barry syndrome, and you can go through the uh, table. Now, in esophageal dysphagia, it can be mechanical DMs, there can be motility disorders, or it can be functional disorder. If we are thinking of mechanical DMs, then we have either intrinsic causes or extrinsic causes for that, and then there comes the motility disorders and functional disorders. We will go through them uh, in coming slides. 
the symptoms the dysphagia can be only to solids it can be only to liquids or it can be to both uh, solid and liquid or it can the dysphagia can be progressive or it can be intermittent when it is usually to solids plus liquids it's a motility disorder we will go through this in coming slides when it is only to solids it's actually because of the narrowing of the lumen. Uh, usually when the lumen of the esophagus is less than or equal to 13 millimeter, then the patient feels dysphagia to some solids. In progressive dysphagia, it's usually because of peptic strictures or obstructing lesions, which is, which is also increasing. And sometimes the patient starts dysphagia, having dysphagia with solids, and then it progressively involves the liquids also. Uh, intermittent dysphagia is usually because of esophageal webs and rings. We will also go through uh, some other causes in the coming slides. Associated symptoms can be heartburn, there can be weight loss, if it's associated with malignancy, hematomasis, if it is associated with ulcers or something like that. There can be anemia because of uh, malignancy, because of underlying uh, cause, because of decreased appetite and decreased intake of the food. And this can be because of the uh, continuous leakage of blood in the intestine. Regurgitation can be one of the symptoms and respiratory symptoms, symptoms such as uh, GERD associated cough and etc. And aspiration pneumonia can be uh, one of the symptoms. The differential diagnosis is based on the symptoms as we have characterized them, whether they are solid uh, dysphagia towards solids, towards liquids, or towards both, and whether the dysphagia is progressive or intermittent. So, when the dysphagia is progressive and it's only to solids, then the main causes are esophageal stricture, which can be, uh, be uh, related to the acid reflux and radiation. Uh, then comes the peptic structure. This is complication of GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. This results from healing process of erosive esophagitis. So other causes for peptic structure also include um, systemic sclerosis, zollinger allison syndrome, nasogastric tube placement, which will cause a local irritation again and again, and that can lead to a peptic structure, and heller myotomy for aclasia. Uh, in carcinomas, uh, there can be esophageal or uh, gastric cardiac uh, gastric cardia uh, uh, carcinomas there can be progressive dysphagia to solids first and then they can also involve dysphagia to the liquids uh, so the patient may have anemia weight loss anorexia or dinophagia uh, associated with the carcinoma so if the dysphagia is intermittent that sometimes uh, the patient has symptoms and sometimes the patient does not have symptoms and it's towards all these solids then we have a differential diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis eosinophilic esophagitis is a diagnosis we have to go endoscopically we can see there is stacked circular ring formation we will see in coming slides then there can be structure formation linear furrows and there can be whitish papules which are eosinophilic, eosinophilic micro abscesses uh, small caliber uh, esophagus is also part of that uh, when you will go for a esophageal biopsy in eosinophilic esophagitis uh, you will see more than 15 eosinophils per high power field then comes the esophageal webs uh, this the esophageal webs or rings are because of iron deficiency uh, which can be plumber vincent syndrome or peterson kelly syndrome and it, it is associated with low mcv anemia and chylonychia uh, uh, then comes the cardiovascular abnormalities any vascular abnormality uh, whether it is related to the arch of the aorta or another when there is a vessel dilatation or something like that which is causing a compression of the esophagus that will cause um, dysphagia so this was the uh, image we were talking earlier regarding eosinophilic esophagitis this is the endoscopic view of the esophagus of a 36 year old male with dysphagia and we can clearly see the stacked multiple rings uh, and the, <coughs> the whitish papules which are the eosinophilic micro uh, this stacked uh, rings the stacked rings actually uh, give appearance of trachea to the esophagus there is narrowed lumen and uh, this is the typical image finding of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. Here we can see esophageal web on a barium swallow, the modified barium swallow obtained in a 45 year old male with dysphagia demonstrates an asymmetric esophageal web arising from the right side of the upper esophagus.
Okay, this. Here are some diagrams which show uh, how the esophageal cancer involves the uh, esophagus, and this is the barium swallow view. Uh, on the other hand, it is this one is the normal esophagus, while this one is actually uh, damaged because of the gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, this is also called an erosive esophagitis. So, if the patient has dysphagia to liquids and solids both, then we have a uh, uh, esophageal motility disorders and functional disorders which come to our mind in esophageal motility disorders ecclesia is the major one which is loss of normal peristalsis uh, in the distal esophagus which leads to the failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax this causes progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids and there is regurgitation of bland undigested food and or saliva uh, in ecclesia. Uh, distal esophageal spasm and hypercontractile esophagus, which is also known as Jack Hammer esophagus, uh, causes intermittent uh, dysphagia to solids and leukids. And in barium swallow, you have crock screw uh, esophagus, which is because uh, which is uh, due to the non contractile, non peristaltic contractions of the esophagus. Always remember that ecclesia is a progressive disorder towards leukids and solids. However, distal esophageal spasm and hypercontractile esophagus are intermittent dysphagia to solids and leukids. Uh, coming to the esophagogastric junction outflow obstruction, this is failure or incomplete opening of the esophagogastric junction leading to the feeling of dysphagia. Then systemic sclerosis, there is history of heartburn and dysphagia, underlying motility, the abnormalities can be there and this can also lead to peptic structure formation. Uh, diagnosis is suggested by skin thickening and hardening plus presence of the extra cutaneous features and serum autoantibodies. Uh, functional disorders we will discuss in coming slides. This is the barium esophagogram showing the dilated esophagus with a bird beak appearance which is characteristic for ecclesia. For functional dysphagia we use Rome 4 criteria uh, which states that the, the patient has a sense of a solid and liquid food lodging or passing abnormally through the esophagus. There is no evidence of esophageal mucosal or structural abnormalities and there is no evidence of gastroesophageal reflux disease or eosinophilic esophagitis on endoscopy. But there is absence of esophageal motility disorders. So all the criteria, all these four criteria should be met. One is the sense of solid and liquid lodging or passing abnormally. The second is there is no evidence of muco esophageal mucosal or structural abnormalities. The third is no evidence of GERD or eosinophilic esophagitis. And the fourth is the absence of the esophageal motility disorders. So all the criteria should be met for at least three months. Uh, for uh, because this is a functional disorder if or if this diagnosis is actually made for the patient then we have to reassure the patient that this is not a serious issue or there is this is not an organic cause and we can give a trial of calcium channel blockers which are smooth muscle relaxants or tricyclic antidepressants summarizing the whole thing which we have gone through uh, on medical history if the patient has difficulty initiating a swallowing, which I already told that if the patient has problem with initiation of the swallowing, then uh, it is oropharyngeal dysphagia. So it states a difficulty initiating a, sw a swallow associated with coughing, choking or nasal regurgitation. This is oropharyngeal dysphagia. If the sensation, there is sensation of food getting stuck in the esophagus, which is seconds after initiation, initiating a swallowing, then this is esophageal dysphagia. So once you have differentiated between a oropharyngeal dysphagia and a esophageal dysphagia, and the diagnosis of esophageal dysphagia is made, then you have to look for whether the dysphagia is towards solids or is it towards solids and liquids both. If it's towards solids, then this is a mechanical obstruction as already mentioned then you have to look for whether it is progressive or non-progressive if it's non-progressive means it's intermittent then as already 
uh, mentioned previously, this is because of esoph esophageal rings, webs, or eosinophilic esophagitis. If it is progressive, then it's can, it can be because of chronic hard ones such as peptic strictures, uh, GERD related uh, issues, or it can be in older adults if there is significant weight loss and anemia, then why not carcinoma? Uh, if the esophageal dysphagia was for liquids and solids both, then this is a motility disorder which can be intermittent or it can be progressive. So if if it is intermittent, then we have primary esophageal motility disorders as already uh, told. Uh, there can be scanty esophageal motility disorders also. And then there, if it is progressive, then this is chronic hard one which can be in scleroderma. And if there is regurgitation and or respiratory symptoms and weight loss, then it can be ecclesia. So this chart is very important. It's different from up to date and you can actually go through this scheme it's it, it will make you your life life easy this is another algorithm showing what will be your approach while in for the investigations of the patient with uh, dysphagia so if the diagnosis of esophageal dysphagia was made and there was no prior history of radiation or acoustic or caustic injury or there was no previous surgery then you uh, you can go for directly an endoscopy the upper GI endoscopy and you can take esophageal biopsies. However, if there was a prior history of radiation or some uh, caustic injury or some surgery, then you have to go for a barium swallow to actually uh, get an idea about the esophageal lumen, whether you can go for the scope or not, then you have to go for the endoscopy. So if on endoscopy, there is a structural abnormality, either it can be a ring or web as I already have shown. There can be stricture, there can be diverticulum, there can be erosic esophagitis. We have already shown a diagram of that. There can be a tumor. We have shown, shown a diagram of that. There can be infectious esophagitis or eosinophilic esophagitis, which we uh, mentioned earlier. If the endoscopy there is normal uh, anatomically, there is no structural abnormality, then you have to go back to your history. Whether the dysphagia was to towards solids only or was it because with solids and leukids? If it was to solids only, then we have to perform a barium swallow if it was not previously performed. So if the barium swallow was not performed earlier, then you can actually go for that. And if there was a structure abnormality which we missed on a per endoscopy, that, that can be shown on the barium swallow. If it is normal or the dysphagia uh, was towards liquids and solids, which was giving you a hint towards the motility disorder, then in both situations, if the barium swallow and the G endoscopy are normal or the history was suggestive for solids and liquids dysphagia, then you have to go for the esophageal manometry testing. So this will lead to your diagnosis of scanty esophageal motility disorders such as systemic sclerosis and diabetes. There can be primary esophageal motility disorders. There can be equivocal results in which barium swallow, we have to go for barium swallow if not done before that. And it can be normal. So in that condition, we have to consider evaluation for functional dysphagia by ruling out curd. For any questions regarding the topic, you can actually go on the WhatsApp and uh, you can send me the questions. I will be happy to answer you uh, and I will like to get back to you as soon as I am free. Thank you.